In episode number 5 of the show from, we discover several new clues that may support our initial theories and previous analysis of the show. Before delving into these clues, let's start going over the highlights of episode number 5. At the beginning of episode number 5, we see Christy examining Sarah after she recovered from the seizure she was having at the end of episode 4. Christy tells Sarah that she should stay over for a little longer so that she can monitor if any of her symptoms reappear or get worse. But Sarah pushes back, telling Christy that she's fine and she wouldn't want her brother Nathan to worry about her. Later, we see Sheriff Boyd Stevens checking in with Christy about the seizures that both Sarah and Ethan had so far. Boyd asks Christy if there's a possibility that the town may be physically affecting people somehow. Boyd ends up revealing to Christy that he's been having hand tremors for long enough that he's been starting to ask crazy questions. But when Christy offers to examine him, Boyd declines, stating that he already knows what it is. This may imply that Boyd may suffer from some type of congenital risk for a neurodegenerative disorder such as Parkinson's, which he's aware of. But the town is somehow expediting or exacerbating the unmasking of this condition. We'll go over a possible theory that may explain this very shortly, along with additional evidence. Going to the Matthews family, we finally see Jim inviting Ethan and Tabitha to play a problem-solving game to help figure out why they're trapped inside the town. Jim explains how they should start asking all sorts of questions, no matter how absurd, and mapping them on a wall in order to arrive at the most likely answers for their problem. Jim starts by writing the question, where are we? This particular scene also shows how Jim's engineering, critical thinking oriented background may end up playing another key role in helping solve the town puzzle. We later see Nathan looking over Sarah's bloody dress from the time she killed Toby, while seemingly feeling conflicted and in fear that Sarah may now be planning to hurt someone else. Back to Christy and Sarah, we see Sarah trying to steal a scalpel from the medical cabinet when Christy comes into the room and invites her to drink some tea. An interesting observation on Sarah is how she appears to be struggling with the thought of harming people, especially Ethan, but her ability to differentiate between right and wrong and translate that into action seems to be overshadowed by her naiveness and blind trust in mysterious voices that she hears and command her to her people in exchange for allowing everyone to go home. Any reasonable person will reason that such a situation or negotiation, if we should call it that, doesn't make much sense. We could even argue that a commonality between Victor, Ethan, and Sarah is a naiveness or childlike attitude about the world that could be potentially exploited by a third party, and maybe this makes these characters special to a certain extent. We later learn that Christy was engaged before becoming trapped in the town, and that Sarah had a problematic relationship, presumably an abusive one, that she was able to escape and Nathan, who's the only family member that she has left, saved her as she was in a very bad place before arriving at the town. If Sarah does have a history of being in an abusive and manipulative relationship, the forces that are controlling her now may have seen this as a vulnerability that allowed them to easily manipulate and control Sarah. I also suspect that Sarah may have had a history of substance abuse, likely connected to her presumably abusive ex-partner, and prior to being rescued by her older brother Nathan. Sarah also tried to convince herself that harming Ethan was acceptable by inviting Christy into a thought experiment that involved doing something really bad, i.e. killing someone to save everyone, to which Christy replied that she would theoretically agree that saving everyone may outweigh the one bad action. We then go back to Jim brainstorming on the wall the possible explanations for them being in the town, and I loved seeing how he even considered the idea of aliens, which we will necessarily go over sooner or later, because who doesn't love aliens? As Jim goes over the well-known evidence of their situation, the broken trees, the crows, the different roads, and everyone coming from a different part of the country, he explains to Thabitha that a lot of things don't really make sense in the real world, and that in their case, something is missing from the equation, likely something obvious that is right in front of their faces. Tabitha tells Jim that there's still a question that they haven't asked, but declines to write it down because she believes it is too crazy and scary. We will shortly revisit this, as this will be a crucial clue for our entire analysis of the show. We later see Julie writing down names of people who may be missing her, including 
seeing her grandparents and friends. Fatima asks Julie if there is a boyfriend or girlfriend for her at home. Julie says that there is no one like that for her, but that's maybe a good thing because that will be one less person to worry about. Concerned about Julie's emotional well-being, Fatima searches for Ellis and tells him that they should take Julie out to have some fun so that she could free her mind. Moving on, we see Jay walking around with the radio while brainstorming out loud about wormholes and alternate dimensions. Jade's behavior seems to be increasingly erratic and may also suggest that he may be experiencing some form of substance use withdrawal. We also see Trudy flirting with Jade and explicitly telling him that had he chosen Colony House over the town, they could be together. This is a good scene to remember that the Norse goddess Freya, whose symbols such as the daisy flower appear to be representative of Colony House is also the goddess of love and lust, which seems to match the overall perspective and behavior of the people at Colony House. We then see Jay brainstorming at the bar while complaining about everyone's complacency given their situation at the town. Jay then brags to Tom, the bar owner, about how people like him design places like the town. Yes, you're gonna be the guy who figures it all out. You're goddamn right I am. People like me, we design the maze, we place the cheese. Let's pay attention to how Jay uses the word maze, a symbol that we have already explored as being evident in the town structure and the poster for the show. Jay proceeds to tell Tom that he recently sold a tech company for an obscene amount of money based on a quantum computing algorithm with an undetermined potential. Jay says that he's not supposed to be in the town, but he should be celebrating instead. He explains that the town is a paradox and in order to solve it, one has to identify the paradox and frame it. Tom, who used to teach philosophy at university, replies to Jay that the paradox he's talking about may be Schrodinger's cat, a famous thought experiment in quantum mechanics that explains how if you put a cat in a box with a trigger radioactive poison, the cat will eventually be both dead and alive at the same time, until we check inside the box, in which case we will only be able to observe one of the states, that is, the cat either being alive or dead, but not both states at the same time. Within this context, Tom explains to Jay that the people in the town may be the cats and that the town itself may be the box, and urges Jay to fix the radio as that may allow them to communicate to the people outside of the box and tell them that they are still alive. This is a very interesting element that the creators of the show have introduced because it may provide an alternative framing to our theory that the people in the town are dead given that they're still missing as far as we know. Now, this is where things may get a little bit complex. If the people in the town were involved in accidents that could have led to their death before arriving at the town, it is possible that they may have been transferred or teleported to a separate dimension or realm, where they will have the opportunity to have a second chance to leave or change the timeline that would have otherwise led to their own death. And maybe we will eventually find out that the people who fell this test within the town end up being found dead in the same place where they were last seen or where they disappeared. This idea is further supported by Tabitha's ominous question on the wall, did we survive the car crash? Which connects to our initial analysis of the first three episodes of the show, where Jim mentions that an accident took place about a mile back and where Tabitha suggests that Jim drives too fast, we will definitely dig deeper into this theory as the show goes on. It is healing too fast. We see Tabitha replacing Ethan's bandages when she asks Ethan if it hurts. Ethan replies by saying that it is simply a little sore. Ethan notices how his mom looks preoccupied and asks her what's the matter, to which she replies that the wound is simply healing so fast. Ethan further adds that he thinks that the town is special and that even though it tries to hurt people, maybe it also tries to help people, and that this should be another question to add to the wall. Ethan says that the question should be, is there anyone trying to help? Interestingly, this echoes our previous analysis that there are likely opposing teams or forces behind the scenes, and that Ethan is likely being protected, even healed, by a faction of these forces, which is why the opposing faction needs Sarah to harm Ethan on their behalf. Additionally, the fast cell regeneration that Ethan is experiencing may parallel the fast progression of Boyd's potential neurodegenerative disorder, 
and suggests that time within the town may run differently or can be manipulated by the forces behind the town. If the latter is proven to be true, this could even explain Victor's aging despite seemingly having the mind of a child, as well as Victor's struggle to recollect some of his memories from when he was a child, which he refers to as dreamlike memories. Nothing is what it seems. Later, we see Sarah visiting Ethan to carry out her orders under the pretense that she wants to play with Ethan. I also couldn't help but notice how Sarah's smile reminded me of that uncanny smile that the monsters have, which makes me wonder whether she's on track to becoming one and maybe the killing orders are some type of ritual aimed at gradually destroying her humanity. We know that Kenny and others have cryptically pointed out that the town can change people, if this turns out to be true and the monsters were once humans, it could explain how many of them have old-timey clothes. Going back to Ethan and Sarah, we see Ethan's parents welcoming her offer to play with Ethan, and Jim and Tabitha even mention how Sarah is such a nice girl. I think the creators of the show are making an effort to drive the point of how appearances can be deceiving, as the Matthews treatment of Sarah contrasts the way Jim and Julie have treated Victor for simply interacting with Ethan. Only that in this case, it is the wolf dressed in sheep's clothes who seems to be the real danger. There's a lake in this place? In an attempt to show Julie the bright side of the town, Fatima takes Julie to a lake where the people of Colony House are having fun like a regular spring break vacation. We learn that Fatima originally comes from Iran and that her father was killed for being an outspoken preacher when she was still a kid and on the same day of her birthday. Fatima stresses to Julie how there will always be monsters in the world regardless of where you are, but that she should not allow those monsters to scare the life out of her. We then see Ellis grabbing Fatima into the lake with him, and it appears that Julie temporarily looks displeased or out of place by Fatima's and Ellie's behavior towards each other, which makes one wonder whether Julie is developing a crush on one of them or their relationship reminds her of a past relationship she once had. Jimmy the Problem Solver We see Jim deeply brainstorming questions about the town, and we notice how he's wondering about the talismans, the way they work, where they come from, and whether they can create more talismans. Jean also seems to be asking the very obvious question of why the monsters don't eat the livestock, and where do these animals come from? Something I like about this show is how the creators are inserting enough reasonable doubt to make us sufficiently question any theory in particular, and that way keep us guessing. Boyd asks for a sign. Later, we see Sheriff Boyd Stevens visiting his wife's grave and asking her for a sign that may help him find a solution to get the people of the town back home. He later even asks Father Catre how he can identify a sign when it appears. We then see Nathan confessing to Father Catre about Sarah's actions, which leads Father Catre and Nathan to rush to find Sarah before she harms someone. Meanwhile, Sarah and Tabitha are speaking at the barn while Ethan helps feed the lamb, which are considered a symbol of sacrifice, Christ, purity, and innocence in biblical literature. This symbological setting is ideal to show what could be seen as Sarah's intent to offer Ethan up as a sacrifice to unknown supernatural forces. To carry out her plan, Sarah tricks Tabitha into the barn and locks her up. Before going into the barn, we see Ethan looking at Tabitha and Sarah almost as though he had a sixth sense that something was off. Also, when Sarah exits the barn, we can see Ethan and the lambs promptly reacting to her presence. As she approaches Ethan, one of the lambs temporarily stands between her and Ethan, which initially seemed as though they were protecting him. Sarah then kneels and tells Ethan that she likes him but not everyone can be saved, and that he will be a hero like in one of his stories. While Sarah attempts to grab Ethan, her brother Nathan shows up and implores her to stop. Sarah breaks down crying while holding on to Ethan and tells Nathan that they promised her that this was the last kill, then everyone else gets to go home. Nathan tries to wrestle the scalpel away from Sarah, allowing Ethan to run free, but in the process Sarah ends up accidentally cutting her brother's neck. Shortly after, we see Father Catcher arriving to the scene as he's in shock and stares down Sarah with a look of judgment. We then see Ethan running towards Julie at Colony House and crying. 
Jim and the people of the town also rush to the barn and set Tabitha free, while everyone is in shock of Nathan's death at the hands of his own sister. After making sure that his family is safe, Jim angrily confronts Boyd and Father Catra, highlighting how this is not the merry-go-round type of town that they like to paint. Father Catra explains that Sarah quickly ran into the woods before he could catch her, while Jim demands a resolution to Sarah's threat. Boyd and Father Catra respond by saying that they will deal with Sarah when she returns before sundown, and that if she doesn't return, they may also consider the situation having been dealt with by the monsters. However, just like Ethan may be protected from the monsters, I question whether the monsters will dispose of an asset such as Sarah just yet, as she is not limited by the talismans or the daylight. Boyd gets a sign. Finally, we see Boyd and Christy at the diner going over the events that recently took place involving Sarah, Ethan, and Nathan. Christy feels guilty for not being able to detect that there was something wrong with Sarah, but Boyd reminds her that what happened was not her fault as Christy couldn't have done anything to prevent it, nor did she cause any of it. Boyd reminds Christy of how she saved Ethan's life and will save many others more before it is all done. Again, we see the concept of saving lives that is being inserted repeatedly into the show's narrative. And as Boyd tries to reassure Christy, the magic jukebox turns on and plays a song that's special to Boyd, which he interprets as the sign that he was asking for. I'll be down. What? What is that? I just got my sign. Episode number 5 ends right here. So far we have seen how many of our predictions seem to be interestingly coming to happen as the show goes on, including the jukebox playing a key source of information for the characters of the show. We will explore possible speculations on the meaning of Boyd's sign in another video later this week. If you would like to be notified of future breakdowns and interpretations of the show's episodes, make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell.